Plum, uh, Mario Bava had a go at them, as well as Umberto Lenzi. Fellini was inspired by them, and D.W. Griffith paid homage to them. Possibly, well, the homage to the film Cabiria anyway, which had a uh, great impact on all things sword and sandal, but more on that in a bit. So what about Peplum? Well, for UK viewers this will uh, be a revelation as uh, we are a very poor relation. Um, always the uh, bridesmaid, never the bride, in terms of having the choice to see such films like this um, and their evolution. These films were uh, pretty big in Europe and uh, big stateside as well. However, we hear of them rarely. Even cool retro TV of yore didn't show them and reputable DVD or Blu-ray releases of the peplum genre are a virtual unknown to the Brits. What a deprivation, as some of these are marvels combining action, adventure, spectacle, drama, horror, science fiction and even hardcore pornography. Peplum, or its other guys, Sword and Sandal films, are a virtual unknown, and this is such a shame. It's not the only thing in England we have to put up with. Draconian censorship, for example, currently rearing its ugly head again, courtesy of the uh, snobby government we have, who act as our moral guardians. It's ironic, really, um, when you think of it, because those individuals that are uh, fiddling about with uh, what we can see online etc or they're trying to pass bills that way. The irony there is uh, for a history of um, people that are steeped in dodgy deals, secret leaks and have indulged in the past in certain salacious antics that more than likely they would try and ban us from seeing online is all rather hypocritical as far as I'm concerned. And it's not only the puritanical conservative lardy dars the Labour Party too are just as bad with their current communist policies and uh, veering towards political correct brainwashing. Not very good to be honest with you, so anyway. Only the internet, that cursed place that warps children's minds, if we are to believe our wretched fractured UK government, has been the only salvation to in fact ensure that the dying breed of provincial chintz twirling prudish types stay down at heel where they should be. And thanks to the internet, this master or mistress of corruption, and I mean that in a sarcastic way, has provided artworks being seen uncensored and deprived to the UK audiences, as well as of course providing accessibility to films and unheard of genres such as sword and sandal epics, which really, to be honest with you, without the net, we would never had seen or known anything about, apart from as far up to Jason and the Argonauts. But there's a whole world um, away from Jason and the Argonauts, a massive sort of um, whirlpool of uh, adventures of gods and monsters going back to Greek times and covering so much. So that's not the only film that was ever created or Clash of the Titans come to that, but uh, owe a great debt to Peplum. I love sword and sandal films, but have to state now that not all of them were epics. Despite this, Peplum films, and Peplum, by the way, is the name given to the style of movies that mainly featured in Greek or Roman times, and a Peplum was a tunic worn by the folk of an ancient civilization. There are a very bunch of films featuring a hefty smattering of daring do in the times of ancient Greece, Rome, or dealt with ancient Christian themes, and in true look, look, and look again style, can also go off at a complete tangent as well, with elements of surrealism and downright smart in some. Most of these nuggets were made at Cinecitta Studios and the majority heralded from Italy. Oh, Italy, you should be so proud of yourselves with your contribution to cinema and the way that you have influenced uh, other places around the world. OK, so you have pinched some of it as well, but uh, some of your remakes I found infinitely better than the ones you tried to imitate. I'm going to be so controversial here when I say, although I adore both films, I would always choose Zombie 2 over Zombie, or to some others, Zombie Flesh Eaters over Dawn of the Dead. So, what of Peplum's roots? Well, 
It could be traced back to the United States of America when, in 1907, the film Ben-Hur was directed by Sidney Olcott based on General Lou Wallace's novel Ben-Hur, A Tale of Christ. This is a scant 15-minute feature directed by Olcott and Frank Oaks Rose and featured Herman Rotgar in the starring uh, role. And, to be honest with you, is far removed from the lavish effect spectacular of the same name released in the 1950s, although we mustn't forget Ben-Hur was uh, made in the 20s as well. It does deserve a mention, though, despite its scant running time as one of the firsts. To really understand that uh, peplum element, we then return stateside to Italy for the zeitgeist of this genre, in my opinion, which was L'Inferno in 1911. In contrast to the self-made moguls of American studios and cinema's infancy, Italian production companies at the time were headed mainly by uh, cultivated members of the aristocracy who made films based on history, biblical tales, or the mythological. Hang on, is that not religion and mythology the same thing anyway? Anyway, which was, dear viewer, in keeping with the uh, literary and dramatic tradition of grand opera, L'Inferno was a tableau-style film which dreamily revealed Dante and Virgil's experiences on their journey through hell. This version of the film was released on uh, DVD with a soundtrack by Tangerine Dream, if I recall. It was uh, brilliant to watch, but uh, to be honest with you, with the soundtrack, I had to turn the sound right down. The format was the um, basis used for an emergence of epics in Italian cinema's fledgling days. Related, I would assume, to their imperialistic victory in the Libyan War spanning 1911 to 1912, and as mentioned, the Grand Operatics. These contributed and resulted in a few epic firsts which demonstrated breathtaking cinematography and jaw-dropping sets that seem impossible for the time in which they were made. These films must have commanded a lot of lira. In this period, we must also be aware of the Roman antiquities that were inspirational in their own merit. The imagination didn't really have time to stretch too far when it came to the creation of such sets of unbelievable magnitude. Only um, what one has ever thought and dreamt of, I suppose, ancient, classical, grandiose, became an opulent reality and uh, seemingly commanded respect as well as visual spectacle from an overwhelmed audience. One can be wowed by the early effects whilst maintaining the utmost reverence for the design and complex craftsmanship seen in these early peplum prototypes, and remember this was a time before CGI. After L'Inferno, the cinema goer could see Quo Vadis in 1912 and The Last Days of Pompeii from 1913, and eventually this all came to a head in Giovanni Pastroni's Cabiria, which ran 123 minutes. This was one of the firsts where the action had finally broken free of being heavily tableau based. Cabiria is loosely based on um, Gustave Flaubert's Slambo and was unusual for its lengthy running time. Kiberia concerns the escapades of the titular heroine, who was separated from her parents at the time of the Punic Wars in 3rd century BC. There is a spectacular explosion of Mount Etna that results in utter confusion, and this is where Kiberia gets abducted by pirates. Kiberia is then taken and sold at Carthage as a slave, and is eventually earmarked to be sacrificial fodder for the god Moloch. Fortunately, she is saved from being roasted by Fulvio Axilla, who is just as um, rascal as nobleman, and his uh, companion, the ex-slave Machiste. The film starts as an adventure chock full of visual treats where costume and set design have meticulously been detailed, commencing with Etna to the savage splendour of Carthage, and we even get to witness Hannibal crossing the Alps amongst many other things. Cabiria was filmed in North Africa, Sicily and the Italian Alps and is rich in concept and style. Cabiria is one of the first motion pictures to be shown in the grounds of the White House and then reached a wider audience stateside with its distribution. 
Not to be outdone, the Americans, as always aim for bigger and better, just like their waistlines, and D.W. Griffiths came up with Intolerance in 1916, and as we mentioned, the Babylon sequence is clearly influenced by this. However, Kiberia got there first. Another legacy um, attributed to Kiberia, um, and this is quite important, is that um, Kiberia introduced us to Machiste, this strongman and Moro crusader played by Bartolomeo Pagano became firmly entrenched in the Italian public's conscience and they had their first superhero. During 1915 to 1926, Pagano reprised the Machiste role in 25 movies spanning 11 years. The unusual element to the Machiste vehicle for this period was that Machiste could enter any moment in history for his adventures. This was also echoed later in the Peplum films of the 50s and 60s, Peplum's heyday. The time travel element ensured that Machiste could be utilised as supreme propaganda for the First World War, as Machiste becomes a World War I soldier in one of the movies. Machiste's agenda was simple, to right wrongs and ensuring good always overcomes evil. In the silent era of Machiste films, the bad element was nearly always corrupt, and particularly aristocratic figures and figures of state were the main target. Where is Machiste in our times, I lament? Perhaps then, and probably pertinent to these times, we have art mimicking life. The series of Machiste films were constantly popular with the public and Machiste's swan song film, Machiste al Inferno, is probably the most well known of Pagano's exploits. When Federico Fellini saw Machiste as a little boy, such was the impact of Machiste al Inferno, it inspired the boy to become a director. The rest is history. Machiste faded during the 1930s and 1940s, but some films such as Cecil B. DeMille's scandalous Sign of the Cross and Italy's Fabiola in 1948 still kept the momentum of Peplum going. Post Machiste, the Italian cinema was mainly dominated by war films and the dominance of the fresh Italian neorealism, commencing with Roma Cita Aperta, Rome Open City, in 1945. However, in the 1950s, a few things happened which heralded the golden age of peplum and ushered in the sword and sandal technicolor future. Machista All Inferno, what from 1926, was re-edited and re-scored, and this began to trigger a resurgence in the sword and sandal peplum adventures. Stateside, in 1956, the Ten Commandments made it to the big screen and become a worldwide smash hit and brought biblical epics back in vogue. Despite your religious views, you cannot deny that the Ten Commandments isn't a cracking yarn and some of the elements paved way to sword and sandal for sure. Another huge thing in America was the rise of the Beefcake Muscle magazines. These magazines featured what some concerned uh, to be the ultimate in masculinity and men who are at the peak of physical perfection. Magazines were readily available for men to buy to inspire them to be a demigod just like the muscle-bound specimens amongst the pages. The magazines could be considered uh, to be the 1950s equivalents of the artificial fitness magazines we can get today or to others, simple wank mags for closet homosexuals and confused teenagers. Whatever they may be, or whether the pages were meant to be stuck together after a finger of the page and a fumble of the cock, or not, is irrelevant really. These also contributed and influenced the peplum genre, as many of the models flexing their pecs with nothing more than a posing pouch and a smile went to Italy looking for fame in Italy's equivalent of Hollywood chin in a cheetah studios. In 1958, the Italian film industry looked long and hard at these homegrown triumphs from half a decade ago, and Machiste was resurrected from his slumber. Based on Argonautica by Apollonius of Rhodes and directed by Pietro Francisci, 
La Fatique di Ercole, uh, or stateside, it was rechristened as Hercules, as the anglicized name proved better than Ercole for the um, American audiences, made it to the big screen to huge success. Steve Reeves, a physique pictorial model, donned his sandals and took up the titular role and joined Jason and the Argonauts as they battled their way through a kingdom ruled by evil tyrant King Peleus in order to gain the Golden Fleece and free the realms from such corruption. Reeves, synonymous with the muscle mag boom of the 50s, is perfect for the role physically, aesthetically, and charismatically, and was cast on the recommendation of Pietro Francesi's daughter after she became aware of Reeves' pin-up status and popularity, albeit predominantly stateside. La Fatique di Ocole was a box office smash that catapulted Reeves to stardom, where he had women and men alike drooling over his prowess and his abilities. Not only were the spectators drooling over Reeves, as the cinema chains were doing the same at the amount of lira that was being generated because of the film. It came to pass that Europe was not the only continent to benefit from this treasure trove of ancient revivalism. American producer Joseph Levine also was captivated by what he saw and immediately acquired the rights to the film. The first thing he changed was the name, Akoli, which is another name for Machiste, as they are in fact one and the same. And fretful this would impair marketing, the lead was rebranded as Hercules, demigod and half-son of Zeus. What Mr. Levine done next was to saturate the distribution circuit with the Hercules film and promptly flogged it to numerous picture houses throughout the United States. Levine then went uh, very dominant in his marketing campaign and promotion of the picture. The dollars rolled in and Hercules became a stateside smash and reached out to the audience, achieving almost superhero status. The film was directed with skill and flair, capturing heroicism, which Pietro Franceschi, behind the lens, captures admirably. As Hercules whipped up a froth at the box office in the States, over in Italy, the follow-up film was actually made which was called Ecole e la Regina de Lydia, which translated for the American audience when that was released was Hercules Unchained. This 1959 film was a virtual sequel to the original, continuing the adventures of Hercules, Ulysses and Hercules' spouse Ioli. Steve Reeves continued with other peplum projects and therefore was succeeded by Reg Park and then by Mickey Hargitay, husband of the doomed film star Jane Mansfield. So he was a bit like a beefcake time lord. Hercules was renewed every cinematic outing or so, and the legend was kept alive. For six years, in fact, with over a staggering 150 films. Some contained monsters, some fantasy, some were historical, dramatic reinterpretations of the classics, and some a bit of a bore, but overall these are wonderfully, wonderfully entertaining. In the next episode of Look, Look and Look Again, I bring you more of a peplum paradise, as we focus on other tales of antiquity. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Hit like if you did, and fuck off if you did not. Until next time, may Venus's blessing be on you all.